Hello everybody and welcome to another A-Level Chemistry exam question walkthrough. This time we're going to take a look at the time of flight mass spectrometer and isotopes. This is a really important question. It always comes up on paper one for chemistry and they always ask you a little bit about isotopes which you find out about using a mass spectrometer and then they follow it up with a calculation to do with probably isotopes and the mass spectrometer itself. As ever, as I go through the question, I'm going to put my thoughts down in blue so you can see the thinking behind the question and the actual answers that are going to get you the marks. I'll write those in green. The question that I've chosen for us to look at today is a 13 mark question and it starts by asking us about isotopes and then it moves on to ask us questions about the time of flight mass spectrometer itself. One of the reasons I chose this question is that the isotope section that it begins with is a bit trickier than the typical type because what they're doing here is telling us about these three different isotopes of chromium and they're telling us about the abundance of only one of them and then they're finishing off by telling us what the relative atomic mass is of chromium. And so if you remember the relative atomic mass is the average mass of all of the different isotopes of a particular element. And so we know the answer here and we know the abundance. But what they are asking us to do is to calculate the abundance of each of the other two isotopes. So we know that chromium 52 is 86.1% and we know that the average is 52.1%. And so typically what we would do is we would set out the equation as I've shown it here where the relative atomic mass is found by multiplying the abundance by the mass for all of the different isotopes that there are, so three of them here, divided by the sum of the abundances, which is typically 100. When you've been given percentage, it's always going to be 100. But if the numbers were a proportion, then it would be the sum of those proportions on the bottom. Now, what's funny here is that we know that the relative atomic mass is 52.1, and we know that the Chromium 52 has got an abundance of 86.1%. And so we've got the beginnings of our expression constructed here. But what we don't know is what the abundance of the other two isotopes is. Now what we can work out, and this is where our first mark comes in, is that the abundance of Chromium 50 and Chromium 53 added together is going to be equal to 100 minus 86.1 because percentages obviously always add up to 100 and so that is 13.9 percent and then the trick here is to make sure you don't fall into the trap of referring to the abundance of one of the isotopes as x and the abundance of the other isotope as y that is absolutely the worst thing that you can do here what we need to do is we need to refer to the abundance of one of them as x so I'm going to pick the heaviest one and so we've got x for that one and the heaviest isotope of chromium has got a mass of 53 so we've got x times 53 as our third bracket and our first bracket needs to be the abundance of the 50 mass chromium isotope multiplied by 50. And so the abundance, if the total is 13.9, and we've decided that chromium 53 has got an abundance of x, that means that the abundance of the chromium 50 is 13 minus x. And from this position, it's just a case of a series of calculations to find out what x is equal to. And so we we'll get 3x being equal to 37.8. And then, of course, we need to divide that by 3 to get us the abundance of chromium 53, which gives us an answer of 12.6%. And so this has got us our second and our third mark. One mark for this expression, which we then found 3x is equal to 37.8. Then we divide it by 3 to get our third mark of 12.6%. And then the final task is to do 13.9 minus 12.6 to get our abundance of chromium 50. And that gets us an abundance of 1.3%. Now, there was no reason at all why we had to declare 
X as being the abundance of chromium-53, we could have had chromium-50 being the X abundance, and if we'd done that, we would have found out that 3X was equal to 3.9%, and so X is equal to 1.3%, just in exactly the same way that we've got here, and then we subtract 13.9%, subtract 1.3, which gets us our 12.6%. So you arrive at the same answer, whichever form you choose to do. Then we move on to a staple isotopes question. So they've brought us back down to something a bit easier here because they're asking us for one similarity and one difference between two isotopes, chromium-50 and chromium-53. Now, isotopes are defined as substances which have got the same number of protons, but a different number of neutrons. And that's all we need to put in these two spaces here. They do occasionally ask you to do a bit of a calculation and state the number of each of these fundamental particles that the two isotopes have got, but that's not necessary on this occasion. The question then moves on to start asking us about the time of flight mass spectrometer, which is the abbreviation TOF. Now, it's worth noting as you read through an exam question the method of ionisation because there is a fundamental difference between using an electron gun, which knocks off an electron, and the electrospray ionisation, which adds a proton. But that's not the avenue that we're going down here. They're simply asking us why it's necessary to ionise the isotopes before they can be analysed. And there's two reasons, and they've given us two spaces, so there's a mark for each of them. So first of all, this so the ions can be accelerated by a negatively charged plate or by an electric field. Either is absolutely fine. And secondly, the ions, when they hit the detector, they generate an electric current. And the size of that electric current is proportional to the abundance of that particular ion that is being detected. So we need to say that the ions create a current when they hit the detector. And that's worth noting when you're writing the formula of something that has been detected, because if you don't put it as a positively charged ion, then unfortunately you're going to be wrong, because it just wouldn't get detected unless it was positively charged. And then the final part of this question is an actual time of flight mass spectrometer calculation. And in these calculations, they could ask you to do one of a number of things. On this occasion, they're asking us to calculate the actual time of flight that's the length of time an ion takes to travel through the mass spectrometer. They're giving us five marks to do this, so we need to do five separate points. So the first thing that we need to do is we need to unpick the actual equation. They've told us that Ke stands for kinetic energy, and they've given us the size of that value. They've told us the length of the time of flight tube. Now that seems a bit odd because that doesn't appear in this equation. But it does appear in a second equation that we need to use, and they've not told us that we need to use it, which is velocity or speed is equal to distance divided by time. And so we've got the d from v equals d over t. Then they've told us the other symbology, which is that m is for the mass of the ion in kg. That is really, really important. And they've told us that v stands for the speed of the ion. The actual command then is calculate the time of flight for the 53 chromium ion. Remember that there were two others that they talked to, to us about in the previous question, and we've been given Avogadro's constant L. So the first mark that we need to follow here is we need to work out the mass of the ion in kilograms. We need to work out what M is. And so M, as I say, is the mass of the ion in kilograms. At the moment, we know that the mass of one mole of chromium is going to be 53 grams. So the first thing that we need to do is turn that into kilograms. So the mass of one mole of chromium is 0 0.053 kilograms. In one mole of chromium, we've got 6.022 times 10 to the 23 atoms. And that's because Avogadro's constant is that many things per mole. And so in order to find the mass of one of those atoms, we need to divide the mass of a mole's worth of atoms by Avogadro's number. Once we do that, we get a value for the mass of one ion of chromium as 8.8 .8 times 10 to the minus 26 kilograms. 
Then from there, we need to substitute all the values that we have into the equation for V, because we need to work out the speed of the ion in meters per second. But first, let's rearrange it. The expression, as we've been given, rearranges to V squared is equal to two times the kinetic energy divided by the mass of one ion that we've just calculated. And so we then calculate what V squared is, substitute the values of 2 times by 1.102 times 10 to the minus 13 that they gave us in the question, divided by 8.8 .8 times 10 to the minus 26 that we've just calculated. That gives us an answer of 2.504 times 10 to the 12. That's V squared. Then the third mark is going to be to square root that quantity that we've just calculated, which will give us an answer of 1.58 times 10 to the 6 meters per second, which is a really big number. The ions travel through the mass spectrometer really, really quickly. M4, now we have got the distance because they gave it to us in the question and we've got the V that we've just calculated. So we actually quite nicely get a mark here for recalling that equation. Then we need to rearrange it to find out T and to do that we need to multiply both sides of the equation by T, divide both sides of the equation by V and so that simplifies down to time is distance divided by speed. And so that gives us a final answer of t being 7.90 times 10 to the minus 7 seconds, which is a really, really short amount of time. And that is the approximate length of time that all ions take to travel through the mass spectrometer. Remember, the lighter the ion, the less time it will stay in the mass spectrometer for. That's really useful to have that up your sleeve if you're comparing the time of flight for two different mass isotopes. One of them will take longer, the heavier one, and the lighter one will take less time to travel through the spectrometer. We need to make sure we use at least two significant figures here, but because they haven't asked us for a particular level of precision, it doesn't matter too much. And just to say something about method marks, if you had said made a mistake at any earlier stage, let's say you forgot to convert the mass into kilograms or something, if you did everything else correctly, you would get all of the method marks. For instance, the stage three, that's for square rooting, whatever answer you got at the previous stage for V squared. And similarly, doing your distance divided by speed calculation, if you'd got the incorrect value for speed here in M3, but you'd then use that incorrect value correctly in M5, you wouldn't be penalised a second time. You'd get error carried forward or transferred error. Right, that's the end of this walkthrough video. I'll see you again soon with another A-Level Chemistry video. Goodbye.